As you can see on the screen, I invite you to open to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Thank you all for being here. When I was very small, I remember that my parents had a book of artwork by Courier and Ives. I remember that name. Remember the peculiar style of art that they, that they did. And this collection in, in a book was very fascinating to a child. One of the things that was most fascinating was on the back, in the back of that book was some artwork that they did. And you had to discover what was hidden in the, the picture. It might be something built into a tree, and it might be an animal. And there, there were just all kinds of animals that you had to look really, really hard to see those images. But once you spotted them, then, then you, how did I overlook that? And that's the kind of thing that I think Paul is going to let us see in this particular chapter, is that there are some things about the Old Testament, in particular the Old Testament. That if you just skim over the surface, you will not see the hidden wisdom of God that was planted there. It was planted there by the wisdom of God. Now sometimes we do not notice it. And if we did not know Jesus Christ, we might not ever notice it. Because it is a hidden kind of of wisdom. And it's a wisdom from God. Now, I want you to notice with me that as we go along with this, this is a very common theme of the Bible. And sometimes it's puzzling to people, especially those who are not familiar with this. And so we need to get familiar with it. And that's why I think it's very important. Because if you do you'll find that the Bible is just a very amazing treasure chest of wisdom and knowledge. Now, holding your place there, I do want to comment that when we're holding in our hand an Old Testament and a New Testament, the Old Testament was prophesying about Jesus Christ. And so it is described in 2 Peter chapter 1 as the prophetic word. Look with me there, 2 Peter chapter 1, holding your place in 1 Corinthians 2 because we're going to be coming right back there. But 2 Peter chapter 1, look at verse 19, when he says, Peter says, we also, and that's also in addition to the eyewitness testimony of the apostles themselves, we also have the prophetic word made more sure. There wasn't any doubt about it being from God, but the point is that you didn't, you saw some things that looked pretty vague, and you didn't know what it was talking about, and now the surety of it comes out because you can see it now. You can see what was intended by the divine hand of wisdom. And so we have the prophetic word made more sure, listen to this, which you do well to heed, listen to that Old Testament. Because if you listen to it and if you heed it as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart, something will happen to your faith. Something will happen to your knowledge And your appreciation, it will be like a rising sun in your heart. Because you've listened to those little glimmers of light that were there in the Old Testament. And then that creates within you a knowledge of Jesus Christ. And he rises in your heart like the sun. He's the light of the world. These are little points of light that you'll see in the Old Testament. Now also, let's go back to 1 Peter I want you to notice in 1 Peter chapter 1 that these scriptures of the Old Testament were intentionally 
difficult uh, to see. That is, you could not see what was intended yet. It was planted there so that you could see what was intended later. You would see it more sure later. But you would see it with some degree of uncertainty when all you had was just the Old Testament and no Jesus yet. So what I'm saying is, when you see Jesus, you start to see him all through the Old Testament, and the Old Testament scriptures become more sure. Now, looking in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, he says, Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. What were they searching? They were searching their own scriptures, trying to figure it out. Because they said things that they themselves did not fully understand. So they were comparing notes. Well, what did you get? And another prophet might reference Daniel or one might reference uh, Isaiah. But they would reference each other and try to figure it out. And so they were prophesying of this grace that would come to you. And he's talking about you Christians. They were, verse 11, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating. He was indicating something, but they weren't getting a clear uh, perception of what the indications were. And so they testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. But they didn't know when or what manner of time, and they didn't put it all together. They had to piece it together. And still, they didn't get the concept clear, uh, clearly in mind. So, when we look at the Old Testament now, we see the prophetic word made more sure. Now, looking back now to our text in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Notice with me Paul's claim about what we Christians, we apostles in particular, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. Meaning that some people don't get it. But if you are spiritually mature, you will be able to get it. We speak the wisdom among those who are mature. Now, keep, keep your spot there. I'll just flip on down to verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. Be ashamed to stay that way. And he's getting on to them because they should have matured. It's kind of like Hebrews chapter uh, 5, where Hebrew writer says, I want to talk to you about Melchizedek. And people don't get the connection. And so they think, well, that's just way too deep for me. And he says, now, if you exercise your senses, then you can start discerning these things. So there's going to have to be some exercise of discernment to see some things. And then he can go on and talk about Melchizedek. And he's going to talk about the typology of that. I'm not going to try to get too deep on this because I can't. But I want to say this. The prophetic word has these hidden pieces of wisdom inside, built inside, so that when you know Jesus Christ properly, you will see him in that prophetic word over and over and over in wonderful, wonderful ways. Now, their prophetic word was intentionally built so that that wisdom could be hidden in there. You will have to exercise your senses to start discerning those things and deal with issues like, what's he talking about, Melchizedek and that kind of thing. But there are different forms and there are different styles of the prophetic word. Go through the Old Testament, the prophecies include a look back at history, 
A look at things that are going on now. A few things that are in the future, especially things regarding the, uh, the coming Messiah. Now, with that in mind, I want you to uh, hold your place here in 1 Corinthians 2. I want to flip back over to the book of, of Hebrews. And uh, instead of chapter 5, where I just referenced your memory, that he got onto them about not being... Uh, able to handle the meteor matters of the law. Here's one thing that he acknowledges at the very front of this book. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1. God who at various times and in different ways. Get that. That God spoke in time past in different ways to the fathers by the prophets. The prophets were used by God to disperse and disseminate this beautiful painting of the shadow of Jesus Christ. And you may not detect that on first reading because there are different ways in which God put it in place. Now, that means that he had to be vague to an extent. Some people want to say, I I don't see all this stuff that you're talking about. The Hebrew Christians and the Corinthians didn't see a bunch of this stuff that Paul was talking about. In the Old Testament, it had to be vague to an extent. In other words, he cannot name him precisely. He cannot tell everything about him precisely. He has to put couch it in terminology so that at the right time you would grasp it. That's very important. So flipping back now to our text. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We speak wisdom, verse 6, among those who are mature. Yet not the wisdom of this age. We don't talk just like everybody else does nor of the rulers of this age. We're not using human wisdom alone. The rulers of this age use their own wisdom. And that kind of wisdom gets you nowhere. It comes to nothing. But we speak, we apostles... We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. That means he hid some things and he hid it because he wanted it to be seen at the proper time. And the proper time was after Jesus Christ came and died on the cross. It was hidden there. For our glory, so that we could glory in this. We could say, wow, I see that. I see that, you know, that artwork in the, in the uh, Old Testament, which none of the rulers of this age knew. They didn't see it. You take just, for example, Genesis 3.15 that says that the seed of the woman would bruise the serpent's head and he would bruise his heel. That didn't. There's not a whole lot you can get out of that. I mean, there's just on its own. Now, you can, once you see Jesus Christ, you can look back and say, oh, I see that now. But on that side, before Jesus gets here, you can't make a whole lot out of that. It's a hidden wisdom that's only going to be able to be seen properly once the Messiah comes. It has to be couched in some kind of vagueness not total vagary because it has to be, it has to be uh, better than Nostradamus, for example, who couches things in such vague terminology that you can apply it to a dozen different things. But it, is, it has such clarity to, to it, uh, too, that you can see how it definitely is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. It had to be vague to an extent, hidden wisdom. And then it had to be clear when the plan was finished. So that when Jesus died on the cross and said, it is finished, 
what he was doing was wrapping up the whole plan that he had put in hidden mystery, hidden words, words that uh, contain hidden wisdom, and then he can finish what that was all about. So it had to be clear when the plan was finished and Jesus' last words indicate that finishing moment is now. That's why after he rose from the grave and the disciples were walking down the road just discouraged about what they had, had, uh, had seen and uh, then Jesus joins up with them and they're unaware of who he is. He begins with the law and the prophets and the Psalms and he speaks to them about the Christ that he had to suffer. So what he was doing was taking that hidden wisdom that was planted there and he was opening up to them that that's all about Jesus Christ and why he had to suffer. After Jesus' suffering then, you can see that hidden wisdom. It is not so clear that the rulers would have said, we better not crucify him. Because that's going, to, that's going to solve a problem of sin for people. Or Satan would have uh, jumped on that and said, we've got to stop Jesus from dying. You see, it had to be couched in hidden wisdom so that the rulers of this world would not see the plan clearly and would not resist what they would have done anyway, and that was to crucify the Son of Glory. God needed Jesus Christ to be crucified, but He didn't need the rulers of this world uh, to see that ahead of time. All right, so now we see that the Old Testament was designed with a hidden wisdom that would be revealed in Jesus Christ. After the crucifixion, the hidden wisdom shows through. For those who seek it. I mean, if you don't want to believe in Jesus Christ, then you won't see that. If you don't see that, you won't see Jesus Christ. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you won't see that. And so it's really a hidden wisdom that is only for those who will seek God and seek His wisdom uh, as He has couched it in terms that we can discover. Now, I said there are types of prophecy. All of the prophecy of the Old Testament regarding the Messiah both did two things at once. It revealed just enough and it concealed just enough. It was perfect. Perfect enough to be there for you to discover it and see the connection after Jesus dies on the cross. Concealed enough to remain a mystery. A hidden wisdom. And yet revealed enough to see the connection when that Messiah comes. It's full of shadowy forms. Paul would talk about the feasts. The uh, uh, Sabbath days. The, the feast days. And he would say those are shadows of the things, good things that would come in Christ. There is typology. That is, here's a person, and he kind of gives us a faint image of something that has to do with Jesus Christ. Adam is compared with Jesus Christ, the first man, Adam, and then Jesus Christ. Moses is a lawgiver, and he compares to Jesus Christ. He's a type of Jesus. All of these characters, King David is a type of Jesus Christ. That's typology. There are prophecies that are direct, that do give enough to say, for example... He's going to be born in Bethlehem. No doubt about that. It's very direct in Micah, for example. But others are kind of strangely given. You look at the book of Matthew and he lists some and you start scratching your head. Well, when I read that, for example, we had one in Bible class this morning from Hosea chapter 11. You read that immediately. You don't see the connection to Jesus Christ. Why? Because it's a hidden wisdom. You're going to have to look a while. It took me a while to see the connection, but nevertheless, we'll talk about that another time. There is direct prophecy that are pretty clear, but not so clear that the enemy knows what to do about it. It is indirect enough so that 
they can't see it and understand what to do with it. So there are some indirect prophecies. There are concept building prophecies. For example, the entire tabernacle and temple were concept building prophecies. They were projecting something in the future. They were concept building prophecies. So that's another way. They become clear when you evaluate Jesus and see his finished work on the cross, as we've said. And like we've illustrated already, it's like an artist building a shadow form. And then when the right time comes, you put his very image in that shape, that shadow, and you say, oh, that shape is Jesus Christ. It's like an artist building a shadow form. The artist finishes the painting. And it becomes clear. I remember not too long ago watching a TV program and this, this artist, he was a guy and he was just using, he was using his hands in, in, uh, in paint. And then he'd get up here and you just throw something down over there and you say, that's, that's nothing. Uh, a baby can do that. And then you see him then get something else and he'd swoosh it around over here and you'd say, I can do that. That's, ter- that's terrible art. And then you get doing some more and he moves some other things around. He said, that's, that's awful. Look at all those colors running together in this haphazard way. I don't see anything in that that a baby couldn't do. And then when he got through, he turned that piece of work like that. And then you said, wow. You saw an image. You saw a man's face in clarity that you didn't see when he was just throwing up the little little bit here and there. And that's what I'm saying about the Old Testament. Is that you're seeing a little dab dab here, a little swish over here, and then you're just seeing all that. And you're saying, I don't see Jesus in that. And then when he gets through, though, you turn... And you see Jesus Christ and then you see his shadow very, very clearly. Now it makes sense. And that's what Paul is talking about. Discover the artwork. And when you discover the artwork and you look very closely at the artwork, something happens to you. I'm not saying something happens to the Bible. The Bible is already wisely built it's you that starts to see things. And it's like this. Turning to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And I want you to notice that Paul writes in regard to the average Jew. He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that their minds were hardened. Verse 14. And he says, until this day, as I I write 2 Corinthians, to this very day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament. Why? They don't see it properly. It's kind of like they've got a veil over their face or a veil over their heart. And they can't (laughs) see it because... The veil to see the Old Testament properly, the veil has to be taken off the heart. And you turn, it's taken away in Christ. When one comes to Christ, he can then see, and his veil is taken off, he can see the Old Testament in much clearer fashion. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, When one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. What does that mean? Well, I see what he's talking about now. I see the connection. I didn't see the connection before. I turned to Jesus and now I see the connection. There are lots of things about the Old Testament and in fact the New Testament as well. But nothing happens. It was already there. What happens to the Old Testament is nothing happens to it. The art was already built in by the wisdom of God. It was hidden wisdom. It cannot be readily seen 
until you turn to Jesus. The testimony of the apostles ought to give us the ability to know that Jesus is the Christ. And then we will see that it turns out that those prophecies did indeed forecast either directly or indirectly an image of Jesus Christ. The built-in artwork begins to bring out the shape of Jesus that was already planted in the scriptures. Now, I said all of that because I want us to start discovering those things. There are lots of things that are just awesome about the Word of God, the Bible, that we need to discover. I want to just give you a, a term that I want you to start working with in your own study of the Bible. This word uh, comes from the Greek alphabet, the chi, which is an X shape. And the reason for that is because they want you to see an indention form, kind of like an X. If you carried it out that way, if you carried it out that way, you'd have an X shape. That's your chi, chiastic structure. And you may not notice those things on first reading, but there are lots of these things. Now, they're not, they're not that way. You just have to discover them. For example, in this section of Genesis chapter 6, and we wind up in chapter 9, here's what I'm referring to as a chiastic structure. We start with Noah, and we end with Noah. We have Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and we end similarly down here. So we come to a common point, and all of our points are very similar, coming down and going up. What I'm saying is you don't, it's not something you immediately see. You have to watch it a while. You have to look at it a while, and then you start to see, yeah, yeah, chapter 6 starts out about Shem, Ham, uh, Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The ark is to be built then we get down to chapter 9 and they're leaving the ark and we got a story of Shem and Noah. We got the flood announced in chapter 6 and there's no flood in the future here. And so another reference. The, 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 the pattern is what I'm trying to get uh, to point out is that there are structures. The, the Old Testament was written with a lot of structure built into it. And you might not notice it on first reading. But as you keep on exercising your senses and start putting it together, you'll see a lot of these things like that all the way through. In fact, it is a very common structure. It's built in. It's not always obvious. You have to look at it a while and you have to study it a while. But learn to discover those things because they help you in understanding the Old Testament. Here's one that's probably on a little easier level. Uh, this was from Joshua chapter 1 verses 5 through 9. And you can see the chiastic structure again. Starting off, I was with Moses, I'll be with you, I'll never leave you. He winds up, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Be strong and courageous, chapter 6, verse 7. And he winds up again, be uh, strong and courageous, don't be terrified, in verse 9. You see, this, it, it, it leads in the same way as it came, or it leads out the same way that it came in. Those are chiastic structures that are built into the formation of the Old Testament. Here's one in the New Testament. Looking at Colossians chapter 3, verse 3 through 4. Listen to this and watch this very carefully because it's a, one of the simpler ones. But this is all the way through the Old and New Testaments. Colossians 3, verses 3 and 4. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ is revealed, you see the connection Hidden and revealed, when Christ and with Christ, God's in the middle. You have died, who is, your, who is our life. Your life, our life. You have died, then you also uh, will be revealed with Him in glory. You see that structure as it's built into the way that He formulates the pattern of, of sound words. And so what I'm saying is, there are things built in, and sometimes you just don't notice them. They're there anyway. You'll understand it anyway, but sometimes your understanding is a little better and improved when you start seeing those particular things. By the same token, and that's not an end to itself, but that's just something for you to start 
uh, noticing more. There are pr- Christological patterns. And here's an old chart because I don't want somebody to say, well, Terry's making up all this new stuff. I'm not making up new stuff. I'm going to use this old, old chart that was before I was even born. See, these are things that people have noticed all through the years. The Messiah is the topic of both Old and New Testaments. Before Christ comes, we have the Messiah in expectation. We expect Him to come. We have the Messiah as we anticipate the Messiah. As we long for Him, there is the longing for the Messiah. There is the need for the Messiah, pointing out our sin and inadequacy and the inadequacy of the animal sacrifices. The entire Old Testament is Christological in that it is Christ-oriented. It is pointing to Christ. And when it gets to Christ, then we see the New Testament tells us what we have been expecting is now realized. What we were anticipating is now accomplished in Christ. What we were longing for is satisfied now. The human need that we had is divinely supplied in Jesus Christ. Now the Old Testament breaks down into lots of different things, but we pick three. Somebody's going to be a prophet, priest, and king. He's illustrated in the Old Testament as something we expect in the Messiah. We anticipate, we long, we have a need for Him. The prophet is because he can open our eyes. We're blind to our sins. We're blind to our condition. The prophet opens our eyes. He helps us to see. Moses was one of the prophets. He was a major prophet of the Old Testament. The priest, of course, was Aaron. What does a priest do? Well, he offers something because of my sinfulness. He deals with the sin issue. One opens my eyes to the sin issue. The other does something about my sin issue. The king that we have is somebody that will rule over us. And so David is the favored king, and every king was compared to David, and the Messiah is compared to David. All of these things pointing to and illustrating that the Christ is going to be all that we need. He's going to be the priest, he's going to be the prophet, and he's going to be the king. He's going to, he's going to address everything. He is the divine supply of everything that we needed. I need to be enlightened, he's the prophet that will enlighten me. I need to be supplied with forgiveness of sins. He's the priest that deals with that. I need somebody to rule and guide me. He's the king to do all of that. Those are the things that you see prophesied. And in the Christology of the Old Testament, you see it fulfilled in Jesus Christ, who is described in the Bible by the Gospels. He's a great prophet of God. In the epistles and Acts, he's somebody who's provided remission of sins. He's acting as our priest. He is a king. Uh, That particular chart may not get that exactly right, but nevertheless, you see the point that they're seeing Jesus as prophet, priest, and king. Here's another old chart, and this just demonstrates that brethren see this. Brethren see, uh, there may be some vagary. Some vagueness, if you look at this prophecy by itself, born of a virgin, the context itself may be a little vague, a little vague if you look at it. If you consider that there's some typology there, then you can see how Jesus fits that. If you look at the born in Bethlehem, excuse me, let me back that back, go back again, let me press the right button. Born in Bethlehem is pretty clear, I don't think we can mistake that. He's rejected by the Jews, Isaiah 53, 3. It's still a little mysterious if you don't know about Jesus yet, but still clear enough for us to get it. He's betrayed by a friend, Psalm 41. He's to be sold for 30 pieces of silver. Looking at that, that's kind of vague. The context doesn't just jump out at you and say, that's Jesus Christ. But once you see Jesus Christ, then you can see his typology there. You don't see every prophecy as a direct prophecy. Some of those are uh, of a different sort. Here's another old, and you can go, go through all of these particular things and you can see that people are seeing the faint image of Jesus Christ throughout the Old Testament. Here's another one. This one dates before my time. You can see it's probably one of those that were 
uh, some of the old time preachers would, would uh, put a, a sheet and they would paint the points that they wanted to make on that sheet and then hang it on the wall. They didn't have PowerPoint, didn't have overhead projector, they used sheets. Some of the old time preachers used that. This is one of the old sheets. This means that these old time preachers did see the points that we're talking about here. We see that this particular preacher, whoever built this one, he saw that the ark was an illustration of safety from danger. And Jesus is the one who provides us safety from danger. He sees Isaac on being offered as a sacrifice, as a type of Jesus offered as a sacrifice. He sees the Passover lamb as something that really points to what Jesus was about. He sees the brazen serpent in the wilderness when they were... Uh, they were being uh, bitten by these poisonous snakes and were dying. And God said, well, build a, build a snake and put it on a post, uh, a brazen brass serpent. And, and if you look on it, then you will, you will be healed. All that was illustrating that if we've been bitten by Satan and he's poisoned us, if we'll look to Jesus, Jesus can heal us. All of those things were pointing to Jesus Christ, the scapegoat. All of that was pointing to Jesus Christ. Those were just five of many, many, many of those kinds of, of, uh, of things that we're saying was hidden wisdom. You don't look at the story of the serpent biting people and putting up on a pole. You don't see Jesus at that moment. You see it later when Jesus comes and you see the similarities there. You don't see Jesus in everything immediately. You see it later when Jesus comes. And so all of that to illustrate this, that the Bible is just really full of the hidden wisdom in the Old Testament. But now I want you to notice what the New Testament says about that. Those things that were hidden wisdom, God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. That's because the apostles were designated to write about Jesus Christ And that reveals that hidden wisdom that was couched in the Old Testament. Romans 16, verse 25. Listen to this very carefully. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation. We're revealing something now. What are we revealing? We were revealing the mystery that was kept secret since the world began. You see, we didn't see all of that until the gospel brought it all out. But now made manifest. Now it's clearing up. And by the prophetic scriptures made known to all the nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith to God alone wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. You see that? That that's what the gospel does. It reveals the hidden wisdom. Here's another one. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 9. And to make all see. God reveal these things to me. I'm writing them a few words. You can read and you can understand my knowledge. Because he says these revelations were to make all see. See something we didn't see before. To see what is the fellowship of the mystery. That which was mysterious and hidden We've got a fellowship now that says, oh, we know what that's about now. Which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent. Why did he hide them there? To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church. The church gets to know it. We get to know it because the apostles wrote it down. When you read it, you can see the connection. That what was hidden is really the wisdom of God. And it's just many fold because you just, you don't cease to be amazed at the hidden wisdom made known by the church. And the church makes it known to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places According to the eternal purpose. God planned it that way. To the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Jesus Christ our Lord. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. 
I hope you see that, that we're looking at something that the apostles affirmed over and over. I didn't make it up. The apostles showed us these things. And if we see these things, we will enjoy the scriptures a whole lot more than we ever did before. Colossians 1 verse 26 again affirms the same thing. The mystery, something that's hidden, mysterious, which has been hidden from, uh, from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. So here's my summary. The Old Testament contains artwork that's hidden. You can see it only through knowing Jesus Christ. The Old Testament contains hidden wisdom. The New Testament is the wisdom of the old uh, revealing that hidden wisdom. So I analyze it in a summary word like, like this. If I had a glove, you can see the shape of the glove is just a shape of a hand, but it doesn't have anything in it. And so you're wondering why, that, why is there a glove there? And then this hand fits inside that glove. And that's Jesus Christ. Now you see some substance is inside the form. The old glove is now filled up. And it was Jesus who was the one intending to fill that glove. So I ask now, in conclusion, can you see Jesus? I'm not asking you to look with your physical eye and see Jesus. It's like Paul wrote to the Ephesians. Do you see him with the eyes of your understanding? Do you see him in the Old Testament? If you do, you can discover him in many, many different ways. This is one of the reasons why the psalmist said and prayed, God, open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. Because when you see wondrous things from the Old Testament and you see Jesus Christ, the morning star of light and brightness is rising in your heart. And brethren, that's the most wonderful thing. Hebrews criticizes brethren, and 1 Corinthians does too, criticizes brethren who remain spiritual babes and can't see. He said, I can't even talk to you about it. You can't see it. Hebrews 5.12, exercise your senses. Take the things that you do know, exercise your senses on those things, And then you'll be able to see that hidden wisdom in Jesus Christ. And then I can talk to you about Melchizedek. That's what his point in Hebrews is. I can talk to you about some of these other things, but you've got to have some groundwork. If you can see Jesus a little bit, you can start to see him a whole lot. And that's what the Spirit of God was relating to the Corinthians, is that God intentionally couch those words in hidden wisdom so that you could see it at the right time. And if you see that and you now understand the Old Testament was about Jesus coming and the New Testament is telling us He's come and we can have great spiritual benefits in Him. You want to be a part of that. If you see that, you want to confess your faith in Jesus Christ tonight and we can help you in your obedience to Him Please come now as we stand together and sing this song.